star-shaped fort on Spike Island was constructed between 1804 and 1815. It's based on a design that was developed in 17th century France. The use of the star shape proved to be very effective in defence and for positioning gun emplacements around the fort. As a further defence, there was a dry moat and outside of that a glacis, an area of sloping ground that was built by convicts and designed to provide a clean line of fire for the fort's marksmen. The, the structure of the fort at Spike Island is all about its, its military function it, and it was um, press-ganged, if you like, into being a prison. I suppose it didn't really become redundant, but it, it, there was less pressing need for it militarily by the 1840s and the, the government was looking for a spillover um, prison location and Spike Island seemed to be uh, an obvious choice, even though right from 1847 onwards they were saying how it was unsuited to use as a prison simply because the philosophy of, of prison design at that time was that you would be able to isolate prisoners, that you would keep them in separate cells. On Spike Island that was never possible. The, the prisoners were in dormitories, in prisoner barracks. But I think perhaps the island itself functioned as a level of separation from society, that it was kind of a proxy for the separate cells, if you like. So right from the get-go, from 1847, we have people saying, uh, we have these annual reports saying it's not really ideally suited to being a prison and it should just be a temporary measure. But it took 36 years before they decided to actually shut it down and not to use it any longer as a prison. It had a, a military prison role throughout its, its life uh, from 1800 onwards, 1804 onwards. But it was a civilian prison from 1847 to 1883 and again from 1985 to 2004. But there was a huge difference between the 19th and the 20th century prison. The 20th century prison had a maximum prisoner number of 102. The 19th century prison had a maximum uh, in the eight, late 1840s and early 1850s of 2,300 prisoners. So whereas the 20th century prisoners were four to a room, the 19th century prisoners were 30 and 40 to a room. Extensive 3D laser scans carried out by Darius Bartlett of the Geography Department at UCC will provide a detailed record of the surviving buildings used to accommodate convicts in the 19th century. Spike Island in 1985 to 2004 was a relatively comfortable, and I say relatively now, comfortable place to be in prison. In comparison, the 19th century prison was a pretty grim place where men were packed together, uh, all ages from mid-teens right up until the mid-80s. Um, and the men in the 19th century prison had to work. Um, for the 20th century prisoners, there was work, but it was voluntary. In the 19th century, it was compulsory. And those men worked uh, long hours, 10 hour days, followed by evening classes uh, a couple of days a week. So they had to go to school as well. And you, you get a sense for the 19th century that the, the main goal of the authorities was to extract as much labor out of these men as possible. By the time you get to the 20th century prison, we certainly got a strong sense from, we did a lot of work in, in what was the school of the 20th century prison. We, we got a very strong sense that in the 20th century, there really was an attempt to, to give the prisoners um, tools in terms of education and so on uh, that would allow them to rebuild their lives once they exited. Whereas in the 19th century prison, there's a, a, a you know, the, that element is there, but it's certainly not nearly as strong. There is evidence to suggest that there were um, different types of or changes, if you like, in the prisoner makeup over the 36 years between 1847 and 1883. Uh, one of the uh, historical reports or one of the historical documents that we have available to us are reports from chaplains and teachers uh, almost on an annual basis uh, for the 36 years of the 19th century prison. And one of those, the chaplain, uh, mentions how the, the 
type of prisoner had changed. Remember that in 1847, when the prison opened, it opened as a crisis response to the famine. And in the 1860s, we see the chaplain commenting on how the men who came into prison in the 1840s and early, early 1850s were just unfortunates who had fallen on hard times, uh, but they weren't necessarily bad people. Whereas by the 1860s, uh, the chaplain is talking about the men being in prison at that time being hardened criminals and that he saw a qualitative difference uh, between the two. And one of the very interesting innovations that happened during the, the time that the prison operated was the government introduced a classification, prisoner classification system in 1855. This was part of a major re, uh, overhaul of the Irish prison system. And one of the um, very positive outcomes from that overhaul was that the numbers on Spike Island were reduced from 2,300 down to below 1,000. And that had a huge impact on um, uh, the mortality rate among the prisoners. And in this classification system, a prisoner was given an incentive to behave well. And they had um, two uh, badges put on their uniform, one on the right sleeve, one on the left. The one on the right sleeve was your overall classification, your prisoner number. The one on the left sleeve was changed on a monthly basis. And it gave a series of marks that you needed to gain in terms of your general behavior, your, your work output, and also your educational achievements. And um, the prisoner could just see by looking to his left arm the number of points he needed to make during a month to improve his position for the next month. And one of the really interesting things that we found during our excavation was part of this classification system. We found some of the brass uh, numbers and letters that the prisoners wore on their uniforms on the actual uh, prisoner skeleton. Um, so this was still in place. Uh, and this would have been a, a kind of a daily physical reminder to the prisoner of what he needed to do to improve his situation. And this was both short term and long term because um, these things were were counted on a monthly basis. So your your diet and the privileges that were available to you, you could improve on on a monthly basis. So you had some control over your environment in your way with this system. And then in the long term, um, prisoners were paid for their labor, um, depending on and the the better the higher the classification the prisoner, the more they were paid. Now we're still talking pittance, but that money was kept aside for the prisoner. And when they were released, they were given this money. And if they promised to emigrate, or if they did emigrate, they were given this as a lump sum. So it was almost like transportation by another means, voluntary in this case, rather than involuntary. Uh, but but as I mentioned, we we've, have found the kind of physical um, evidence, if you like, of this classification system in place. So there, there were distinctions between prisoners and, as I say, post-1855, the prisoner himself was given an incentive to improve his lot, as I say, both in the short term and in the long term. The other class of prisoners that we, we don't really have um, access to at the moment were the political prisoners because uh, most of the prisoners in the Spike Island convict uh, jail were, if you like, ordinary decent criminals, but there were also political prisoners. Now the, the authorities were not anxious that the political prisoners should die in prison because that creates martyrs. So what they did was they tended to uh, let them go on condition that they would live in exile, that they would go into exile. So again, it was transportation by another means. Early on in the, the life of the prison, in its almost in its first year, we have uh, the first uh, political prisoner that we know about is John Mitchell, uh, after whom the, the fort is now named post-1938 when it was handed over to the Irish authorities. The fort was renamed Fort Mitchell in his honour. Mitchell was a gentleman um, of the Young Irelander movement, part of a broader revolutionary movement in Europe in 1848. And he was treated with kid gloves. Um, we have his jail journal, a very famous um, writing uh, in the kind of Irish struggle for freedom and so on, uh, where Mitchell wrote about his incarceration on Spike Island. He was only there for a very short time, but he was treated very well. Um, because he was uh, an upper class individual, the guards said, you know, you're a gentleman, we're gentlemen, if you behave well, we won't put you in a uniform, we won't put you in manacles and so on. So he was treated very well. <laughs> 
We know from historical accounts that some of Mitchell's political heirs, those who were part of the Fenian movement in the 1860s and 70s, were treated very harshly. Unlike Mitchell, they were not considered gentlemen, as they were from a working-class background. Further research and excavation is needed to establish the exact nature of the convict hierarchy and their treatment within the prison. Coming up in episode 3, we look at what it means to be an archaeologist.